Okay, hello everyone. Hi, uh, I am Erica. This is Surfbot and Let's Encrypt Office Hours. Um, unless you're just sitting here because it's a nice shady spot, in which case, welcome anyway. Uh, I had in mind that this would be pretty free form if anyone has questions. Um, maybe just to get a show of hands. Who came to this, like, hoping just to kind of hear what w other people had to say without, like, specific questions in mind? Maybe, maybe, uh-huh, uh-huh. Okay, cool. Uh, who had individual questions about their use of like, oh man, I want to use Certbot for this, but uh, will it work for that? Or I need to use Let's Encrypt, but I'm getting rate limited, stuff like that. Who had, who had questions like that? Okay, uh, who had general questions about the way that Certbot or Let's Encrypt work that they think might be interesting to a larger audience? Who didn't raise their hand? Okay, interesting. Uh, maybe I should continue asking who didn't raise their hand to the who didn't raise their hand because I think there's still more of those. But anyway, um, okay, I've got a mic here. Thanks. I have a mic here for your questions because otherwise we can sit here and stare at each other. So, okay, who has a question about Surfbot and Let's Encrypt? Who came here to learn what Surfbot and Let's Encrypt are? Okay. <laughs> Well, this is this is your hour. Um, I actually was recently informed that this might be not a universal thing. Office hours is like a university term. It means that like generally the professor or grad student will sit in a room and people will bring their questions. So that's what this is. If you didn't realize that, sorry. Yes, Mike. Maybe it's not directly related to CertBot, but uh, for using DNS challenges, I would not like to make my domain uh, for dynamically updating. Uh, and the question is, is there another hook or trick to use DNS challenge without make the entire domain possibly for DNS update? Uh, if you want to use this, <laughs> yeah, go ahead. We have uh, a helper here who also works on Surfbot. Uh, but uh, it's not, uh, can we like... Uh, oh, do you uh, want to, yeah? No, I, I would like to, to uh -huh. show you something. Uh, it's not delegate, it's a uh, DNS, uh, like a server I wrote. Uh, yeah, uh, I'll just see how I can get... He wrote a thing to help you do this. Yeah. So, um, okay, so uh, it's a uh, subdelegate DNS. Uh, The problem actually is uh, uh, pretty easy to solve. Uh, you are able to, uh, well, let's encrypt follow C names. So all you have to do pretty much is to point to C name uh, from uh, like the magic subdomain underscore acme uh, dash challenge dot your actual domain dot TLD uh, to uh, whatever domain, domain you wish. And uh, you can use a throwaway domain for the actual validation. So your whole, whole DNS zone doesn't get compromised. So you create uh, your domain uh, dot throwaway domain dot TLD uh, C name. Uh, and uh, actually update uh, TXT record, record to that one. But this one. Uh, I will show you. Um, <coughs> there's an uh, actual recorded uh, video. Uh, how it actually works. Uh, I wonder if you can see. Can you see it? Like, is it large enough? And uh, let's see. Smaller. <laughs> uh, I wonder. Where is the? 
Yeah. Oh, okay. Too small. Um, <clears throat> so, let's go back. Anyway, uh, okay, I, I'll explain it. Uh, you have uh, like a one-time task that's manual. You create the CNAME record uh, to your actual domain. Uh, like uh, you want to, um, you want to have a cer certificate for uh, your domain .tld. You create the CNAME from underscore acme uh, dash uh, challenge dot your domain .tld. That points to whatever, uh, yeah, yeah, and uh, the uh, another domain is the one you can like uh, update the txt t record to, and the CA will follow the C name and uh, use the txt value from the, the throwaway domain in a in a sense. Uh, but what the um, Acme DNS does, uh, it's. Uh, it actually um, it ha has an HTTP uh, API that you will be able to use to update the TXT records. So it's pretty much just a DNS server with an uh, API, right? Uh, but the API only uh, allows updating of TXT records. So the so the worst case scenario, uh, if your box gets compromised, is the same with pretty much every compromised box uh, in regard of uh, certificates. So the attacker will be able to get to get your cert get certificate for your dom domain, but uh, but that it, it limits to that. And uh, all the credentials to the API they are randomly generated, and uh, you are able to pretty much use uh, the one instance for a lot of. Uh, large amount of uh, uh, different domains and uh, create a lot of uh, API keys and uh, use that. So it's basically a sub-delegate domain uh, um, server. Um, I'll see if there's something else. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, So yeah, uh, did that uh, that answer to your question? Uh, there's a lot, lots. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot, lot in that one, but uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Also, Peter has just arrived, who was around when it was founded. So if you have more questions about that as well, those are also on the board. Uh, I am a, oh, I guess I should have said, I am a developer on CertBot, and you just got uh, answered questions by another CertBot developer. So uh, definitely here for those. Yeah, yeah. Those mics. Thank you. Uh, I just attended your usability talk, and uh, as a developer and system administration, uh, the best part is having certificates. Uh, the worst part was the user interface. Uh, well, first the sudo thing to automatically update stuff. I mm -hmm. can't use that on my servers, and but uh, lots of things changed. There are better, there are other clients, and and that works. Um, but what I'm still wondering is, I, I get or two things. One, I didn't have to supply an email address when I created the account, so I don't get messages. And two, I'm getting lots and lots of emails that my uh, certificates are about to expire, but when I actually check them, uh, it's not. Uh, I don't know about the second one, but you <laughs> don't actually technically need an email to sign up. Uh, there, we have a flag, uh, register unsafely without email. Um, there's reasons that we might want that email there. Uh, as for, no, uh, so what do you consider about to expire? Well, w um, can you repeat the like, question? Uh, we send them like weeks in advance so that people have time and remember. Um, yes. Uh, 
Um, and yeah. It, yeah. Yeah, because I've mul I've multiple servers hosting the same domain, so I I re request them for multiple servers, mm -hmm. and I renew them automatically every. 60 days or something, and I get those emails as well. You renew them every 60 days, and you're getting those emails? Yeah. Ooh, okay, yeah. And that's, mm, uh, yeah. Write that one down. Thanks for reporting this bug. Other bug reports are welcome. All right, I'll do that next time I get one of those emails, I'll follow up with uh, an actual bug report. Thanks. From what I know, the certificates expires after 90 days. Okay. Do you see statistics that a lot of people uh, try it, uh, get a certificate, maybe install it on some server, and then forget to uh, to uh, renew to renew it? Because th then there are a lot of websites will be like with a warning and. Uh, the user's behavior will change that yeah, yeah. It I don't have a number I, the thing I will say that we've been doing which is uh, at least for certbot users and of course let's encrypt is, is bigger than the certbot user base is just trying to make for the default case uh, automatic renewal be the default. So if we can figure out how to automatically renew your certificate for you, we'll ask you, hey, do you want to do you want us to do it, run a cron job to automatically renew this? And if you say yes, we'll just do it for you. Because if people are running around or like uh, doing homework every time their certificates need to be renewed, we haven't done things right. We're living in the wrong universe. We, we want to live in a world where once you enable TLS, it stays enabled and doesn't fall over because no one's looking at the box. Um, so for us, the settling on three months was, was partly about saying, we know we need to automate this. If we pick a year, we're just pushing off, like putting off the time when we like figure out how to do automation correctly. Uh, and maybe for the first six to 12 months that we launched the project, the tools we were providing were not as polished uh, as they needed to be for that. I think they've gotten much better. Um, and so now if you run Certbot through Debian or Ubuntu, it auto renews for you. We're about to ship that for Certbot auto users as well. Do you have any plans for like a uh, pass? Like uh, for example, for the big players like uh, Asia or uh, Amazon? So where, where you have just a, a platform as a server, where you have a website, you don't have uh, access to, to so much. Uh it, it's already happened. Like uh, most of those platforms, the ones where it makes sense have already integrated with us. So WordPress, um, uh, uh, Squarespace. Um, if you're a large hosting provider and you weren't doing TLS before, most of those people have turned around and started using Let's Encrypt automatically or, or making it an option for their customers. I tried to, uh, to have a look uh, at how to install it and it's like, <laughs> there are some integrations with, uh, with uh, Azure, but it's like uh, complicated and uh, I really wonder if uh, after three months I don't uh, forget about it. Yeah, I think Amazon, if I remember correctly, uses their own certificates. Like they'll they have a platform as a service certificate provider, but they're not going through Let's Encrypt. They're just 
doing it themselves, which uh, I might not be super surprised to see as you're doing, rather than the Let's Encrypt integration. Yeah, the, the, lots of people who host on EC2, of course, use Let's Encrypt because with EC2, you're not getting like you're not getting a fully managed service. You're just getting a box with a shell on it. And so for for that portion of Amazon's user base. Lots of them are using us. But Am S3 is right, using... Right, for S3, Amazon launched its own CA at about the same time as Let's Encrypt. We we talked to them a little bit during the launch process and we're like, oh, you're trying to do this, we're trying to do this. Okay, like, we're kind of... We, we, we have the same objective, which is encrypting the web and we were working on it together. Thank you. Things you always wanted to know? Thank you. I'm also a developer and um, I'm working with uh, several environments like Ruby and Rails and Elixir, for example. So they are. Um, not directly known, I would say, to uh, web servers like Nginx or Apache, and so there is no real automatic configuration possible, and I fully understand that. Um, but I think it would be a chance to get more people like me. Um, I, I'm using Let's Encrypt for years, meanwhile, so I'm, I'm happy with it. But I think it would be a possibility to get more people on board by providing more detailed um, um, documentation on doing maybe not automatic uh, um, uh, installation, but more like uh, hands-on with uh, special configuration needs. Have you looked into either our hooks or our plugin system? To be honest, the, the, the initial installation worked fine. And then when I tried to renew, I got the error message that I wouldn't be uh, allowed to do so because I was would be lacking uh, sufficient privileges, which in, in direct translation isn't true because I'm the root of this server, so I was a bit surprised. And then I just Googled for, for, the, for the reason and uh, with the combination of the application server that I'm using and somebody else pointed me that you just have to configure the proper uh, public directory and then the Let's Encrypt uh, automatic bot knows where to put the certificate and then everything works out nicely. So it was just putting one line of configuration in, in the Let's Encrypt config and now everything works fine. And, and to find these little nuggets, that's the challenge for me. So there were permissions on some directory that, were, that needed to be changed? Uh, no, um, Let's Encrypt. Uh, Certbot didn't know about where to put uh, uh, the certificate to because it's not the standard path. It's not the standard path for Nginx, but uh, 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 the passenger web application server has a different uh, logics regarding public paths, and uh, obviously, um, Let's Encrypt Certbot didn't know how to um, interpret the configuration file of the virtual host. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, if I'm understanding correctly, you wanted Certbot to put the certificate that it gets in a particular spot. Right. Mm -hmm. That solved it so that now uh, update is handled completely automatically. Nice. Yeah. Uh, and then pointed directly to that file there. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so, the way we have it there is everything is symlinked. Um, so, we have the actual files kept in an archive directory and then the live active certificate just points to the other ones. Um, Sorry, I wasn't clear. The problem was not, not the location of the certificate, but this, uh, the, the um, proof. Uh, I don't know what's the name the of chain? it. The chain? Acme Challenge. Yes, right. Web that's brain. one. That's the one. Uh, the, which, which of those was it? The web? The, the, the web challenge brain? file. The challenge file. Oh. Oh. Interesting. Um, it was not in a public directory regarding that application server, so obviously it couldn't find it, and so it thought it, I, do, I don't have permission to mm -hmm. uh, to manage that so server. So the application server couldn't access the file? The application server wouldn't uh, serve mm -hmm. that file because it was in a different location than it was in... Was the application running as root? Uh, the application was not running as root, no, no. Uh -huh, yeah. yeah, we've had a lot of bugs with some version of that that character, you know, people ne needed to set some permission in their web server to make uh, the web root accessible. If they're using the web root plugin, because we have m multiple different plugins, uh, Eric has written this Nginx plugin, 
which you can now use. So then you don't need to put a file in, in any directory. It'll go straight to your Nginx configuration and modify that. So, but it illustrates the complexity of the task that Certbot is trying to do, which is like, okay, you need, you're running on some web server and there are like 10,000 different ways that web servers can be configured. And, um, and with application servers behind these web servers, then interfering with the web servers even. Exactly. So what we provide is a, a very flexible toolkit um, that let, gives you, you know, usually five different ways to provide the proof successfully and get a certificate out the end. But it's hard to guarantee for every use case that there's a magic thing that will work for everyone, right? All we do is provide, you know, five different kinds of magic. You've got to try them or Google the, pr the error message you get and, f and figure, oh, okay, like in my case, I needed to do X. So it sounds like what would have been useful at the time when you were figuring this out was an explanation of what Certbot was doing and where it was putting all these different files and what, w what it was trying to do. Is that right? Yeah, maybe yeah. kind of an uh, exotic uh, uh, configurations uh, page where <laughs> also people can contribute what they have found out because I assume yeah, that you can't even imagine what could happen because mm -hmm. there are so many different kinds of using Apache. So it engine. sounds like you eventually found out what you had to do. How did you find that information? By Googling it. A different person figured it out. It, uh -huh. it was just adding the line of the web root and that fixed it. Yeah. So it's a one-liner in the end. And mm -hmm. uh, it, it, I, I can share that with my community and my bubble. That's quite easy. But obviously, I couldn't make this information accessible to other people who are using the same web service. Mm -hmm. um, if, if I could uh, provide these uh, uh, kinds of information to the third part documentation, maybe that could help. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, well, we definitely would love any pull requests to the documentation. Uh, it's all on GitHub. Uh, and we, in fact, are recently we've had a bunch of updates to our documentation from an outside contributor who's been very helpful at explaining at least some of those things. Um, yeah, I don't think we currently have a section for exotic configurations, but hey, if you want to create it, it's open source. It's what it's for, right? Um, yeah, for now, I think we mostly use the community forum for that, but we'd love to have more documentation about how to do it for a particular web server. That'd be great if you want to contribute that back. Didn't even knew about that forum, for example. OK, thank you. Yeah, thanks. And thanks for providing the, the certificates. It's awesome. Welcome. Thank you. OK, if you just came in, we are doing Certbot and Let's Encrypt office hours where you bring your questions about how Certbot works for you, how Certbot can work for you better. If you have suggestions as well, we'll take those also. Anything you always want to know, our deepest, darkest secrets, uh, people, developers' favorite color, what Peter eats for breakfast, anything is a game. I'm volunteering Peter about the breakfast thing. That might not be accurate. Anyone, anyone questions, questions? Yeah. I guess this is the question chair. Um, so I think with the, what Let's Encrypt is doing is great. Um, I use it for all my certificates now. It's so easy. Um, and it's, I think it's a wonderful advancement for encryption on the web already. But it's still right now creating for people who, who need a lot of certificates or I made away or don't want to spend lots of money on certificates. There's still only one CA, Let's Encrypt, that does this. I know there's been lots of talk about another CA can use the Acne Protocol. It's open source, so that. Um, I'm just curious, from your point of view, since you probably know more than all of us here because you're more involved, is there any actual interest from other CAs or another organization trying to take up the same thing to add, add basically try to become a competitor of you guys? Not that you need to compete because it's a free service, but I, I, I fear like one day maybe say Let's Encrypt goes down, um, worst case scenario, but then now there's, there's, there's a giant vacuum versus having a backup plan. Uh, yeah, no, that's we. That's something I think we all agree with. Also, like uh, it's not a competition. It's not like we're trying to get the most active users. We all think it'd be great if someone else wants to come in, step up. It's just it. It's you know an organization. It takes time. It takes resources to do things like this. Um, if you happen to work for an organization that wants to run their own version of one of these, uh, that would obviously be welcome. Um, we've seen. Some CAs using, if not Acme, then Acme-like things, but that's more for like um, meant for corporate internal certificate things that they're selling as a software as a service. We haven't really seen anyone else interested in doing the completely open to the public, get your certificate here thing. Um, except I think as we mentioned before, 
uh, maybe Peter mentioned, uh, Amazon does something similar, but only for their customers. Uh, just having something that's completely open, which even having it for specific services isn't the worst case, as long as what we see is having automated or even automatic built-in certificates for a way that people can do things is something that I think Let's Encrypt has helped push that there wasn't as much of an impetus for before. Having literally another Let's Encrypt is probably nice, but even just seeing people do roll their own versions of it for their own software is already a win. Okay. I guess the follow-up to my question was, what, um, in creating Let's Encrypt and getting trusted by all the major browsers, what was probably the largest hurdle that if another company was to take on that challenge, like you just said, they would encounter? So there are two. I mean, one is... Uh, it turns out that you don't need to get trusted by the, the major browsers. That's strangely irrelevant. Uh, what you need is to find an existing certificate authority that will cross-sign uh, your certificate. Um, and you need to pass an audit. Uh, and those are both quite a lot of work. You know, you need to either, like, by charm or, or payment, persuade a CA to do this. And then you need... Um, to do a lot of paperwork and a lot of like security through bureaucracy to pass the audit. And then you need the operational sophistication to run a service at scale um, that's doing security critical stuff. And that, that's almost completely orthogonal to the bureaucracy piece, right? You know, you have to do real computer security and then like bureaucratic computer security. Um, and the cost of doing that, you know, I think, um, ISRG, which is the organization that, that is the, the home for Let's Encrypt, though like lots of the development still happens at EFF and a little bit still at Mozilla. Um, uh, that organization now has a budget in the range of one to two million dollars a year. Um, and so that gives you an indication of like the ongoing expense for doing this. And maybe you could do it a little bit more cheaply, um, uh, especially if you weren't starting at this, you know, at this point we actually have serious scaling costs with Let's Encrypt. Um, but uh, the question is, who is going to show up and, and stake roughly that amount of money on a new project to do something that's already happening? And the answer might be, like, there's not that much incentive to do it. Uh, so we would, I think, really like to, there to be another CA, especially another CA that, that, like, has an open API, ideally speaking Acme, but maybe, you know, speaking something else, whatever it is. Like, that would be great. It would be better for the internet to, to, um, to have something as a fallback in case we fall apart for some reason. Um, yeah, and I think it would be easier to get that number down because, well, it depends how you do it. So Boulder, the implement the implementation of the Let's Encrypt backend is open source. So it's much easier just to jump in and use that. Uh, it might perhaps be more ideal to create a completely separate second implementation. That way bugs in one aren't also in the other. But even if a separate organization literally just wanted to run that software and they already have secure servers that they can use, uh, that already takes you a lot of the way there because you could share some of that effort and still get the benefits. Probably the most likely place to, to look for this is the existing other CAs, right? Like it's a lot of work to become a CA for the first time, but Amazon's a CA, Google's a CA, there are the CAs who used to sell certificates, or still sell certificates to everyone. Maybe one of those organizations is the best place for us to look for a second free service. Thank you. Thanks for asking the questions. Microphone offered free of charge. Yeah, so Let's Encrypt is practically uh, making uh, an existing process uh, available to a larger uh, population, let's say. Uh, where do you see it going? I mean, as a project and as a, let's say, industry? the certificate authority Where do we see it going um like what's the end game uh, so we're not we recently passed uh, recently i guess it's been a few months now passed the 50 percent mark of uh web traffic being encrypted which was a big milestone but that's halfway there i was recently looking at some projections from like 2014, 2015, that were like, oh yeah, by 2016, 80% of the internet is going to be encrypted. We're not there yet. Uh, there's a long tail. There's a lot of sites, uh, problems to fix. Like, 
the, I mean, a, a lot of the traffic goes through a few small players, but the rest of the traffic still needs to be encrypted. There's still a while to go. And we're biting off a lot of that in chunks. More and more certificates are being uh, served. But I think finishing up that process, like uh, what's the old saying? Like 90% of the work takes 10% of the time and vice versa, right? Um, so there's still a long way to go there, I think, is the foreseeable future and continuing to make it easier for people to use their certificates and all the different use cases that people might need. Um, so like different ways of authentication, for example, like having the DNS challenges versus HTTP um, and getting that down. Uh, it's currently being standardized in IETF. Um, so there, and there's even a process for having new ways of proving that you own a domain. Um, so that'll get more people on also. But I think getting to that 100 or near 100% of traffic, there's no reason, I think we believe that there's no reason that the traffic needs to be unencrypted at this point and getting to that place is the goal. Yeah, so that's, uh, Eric is totally right. It, there's actually an amazing amount of work still left to be done for encrypting the internet. Uh, another project that we're gonna be working on in the next year is mail servers. So getting Let's Encrypt to auto-deploy to mail servers and then saying that that's comparatively easy. The hard piece is no mail server on the internet is currently configured to check certificates. Um, and so what we're going to try and do there is say, okay, wait a minute. If I'm delivering to a random mail server, okay, I'm, I'm not going to necessarily expect encryption or check a certificate. But if I'm delivering to a mail server that has marked itself as committed to a secure deployment, I'm now going to check the certificate and fail um, or at least alert very loudly if I don't get a valid start TLS connection. So we're, we're trying to close that authentication gap in uh, email delivery. Um, that's one objective. A second objective is at the moment, if you can compromise routers or BGP or DNS, you can steal a Let's Encrypt certificate, right? Because our, our, our validation methods are TCP, which is the same as the previous CAs. Um, but we'd like to offer a way of ratcheting that up. Once you've got a Let's Encrypt certificate, there should be a way of saying, now that I have this, TCP is no longer good enough. You now need crypto to get the next certificate. Um, and the problem with that is uh, you need really good failure recovery modes. When someone does this, they install Let's Encrypt or Insert Bot on a box, they get a certificate, they, they, they pull up the ladder after them and only, they say only pure crypto now, and then they accidentally delete that virtual machine or the hard disk that they had on that server dies. How do we make sure they haven't hosed themselves permanently because we turn on this feature for them? So we have like engineering work to do on that front to figure out what the, the, the security ratchet will look like and how to make it recoverable and, and still secure. Um, so those are examples of like the hard engineering problems that we see ahead for us to solve. Is it, yeah. uh, regarding the mail server, um, I'm running mail server with other people together. And uh, we are refraining from using uh, Let's Encrypt for the mail server since we um, want to make sure that uh, the traffic... So uh, our threat model is more or less... So it's more an activist mail server. So our threat model is state and state agencies. So it's easy to, uh, to create whatever by state-driven or other CAs a valid certificate. So uh, we are more in the model of pinning specific certificates of other trustworthy um, servers, mail servers, and so on. So this would be hard to do with Let's Encrypt, since uh, due to the 90 days or less um, expiry date, it will be, uh, so we put some automation uh, automation into this uh, model, but it's... Uh, what do you currently do when their certificates fragile. expire? Um, no, uh, currently um, the other uh, mail servers that we communicate with and that we want to have a reliable communication, we are uh, via their certificates, not just random valid certificates, but their certificates. Then we um, define their certificate names and so on, and we have some exchange pool of uh, some Git repositories that we share and sign and so on. So it's a uh, not so great process, but it's uh, it's paranoid and it works. So you're using Git as your protocol for this, basically. But it's bad, yeah. Yeah. So SSH and, and you have, you sign your Git commits. We actually thought about trying to use Git for this, um, and I think probably that's not how it'll happen in the end. Uh, but um, you know, you need a place that's 
it's a little bit like the preload list for browsers that says for this domain, always expect TLS for email. And then secondly, always check a certificate. And then thirdly, maybe pin a certificate, right? Which doesn't have to be CA signed, right? You, or pin the private key. So then if you're using Let's Encrypt and Certbot, you can make a new certificate every 90 days, but keep reusing the private key. And so you have a pinning thing through one path and then a certificate through another, but the certificate uh, updates and the key stays the same. Uh, um, so this pinning of the private key would be a solution. I'm not in that, uh, that in the, uh, so is this available for Postfix or something? Well, at the this moment- This is something we're working on. At okay. the moment, actually, you could totally do it. So, so it wouldn't be a Postfix, Postfix plugin yet. What you would do is you would use a certbot to get the certificate and then you use a hook to install it in Postfix uh, or just no, copy it to your uh, Postfix configuration. I meant, the pinning. The I meant the key pinning, the private um, key pinning. I think we actually might have just shipped uh, that. I think there was, a, there was a pinning for certificates. I had this feeling of certificate, uh, not for the key. That would solve the problem, obviously. I don't want to make a commitment about what you okay. can put in that Postfix config file. Thank you. But if you can, uh, maybe if you can't even can't put it in a postfix configuration file, but you do a separate check outside of that to check that the key is the same. Like I, I don't know whether or not postfix can do this, but if you can have a mechanism for pinning the key, like that's a, you could do that externally. Is what I'm saying. We'd also maybe love to work with your project because you're trying to you you essentially built a smaller version of what we want to build into Certbot and maybe done it slightly differently, uh, but it's a, it's the same use case. And we, we just want to scale it to the whole internet. Um. But uh, the threat model is somehow different. So we are thinking about the state adversary and you are thinking about uh, non-encrypted traffic and users trusting in somehow authorized good traffic. In the long That's run, okay. we, in the long run, we want to protect against state adversaries as well. So at the moment we don't, of course, because the state adversaries have their own certificate authorities, but, um, there's a, a protocol called CAA that you can use to um, uh, announce over DNS which certificate authorities can sign for you. So you can use that to lock down which CAs can issue for you. And you could do that in combination with the thing I just said we're working on, which is a way of saying with Let's Encrypt, at some point you can say only cryptographic proof of control of domain. So once you get a, a Let's Encrypt certificate, you keep chaining to your past keys for authentication. And and then the combination of CAA plus now Let's Encrypt won't be vulnerable to TCP-based attacks, um, then we'd be potentially hardened against a state adversary uh, for authentication. I mean, it's, it's, it's a, a couple of pieces, um, but I think we also want to be compatible with people who have the use case you're describing. Um, We'd want, if we're making an announcement protocol that allows people to announce security policy for their mail servers, you know, one policy you can announce is always do start TLS. A second policy you can announce is um, check my certificate using the public trust CA stuff. A third policy is this exact pin key or this exact pin certificate. And so we probably want to support the type of, the, the type of pinning you're doing in addition to the other kinds that we, we do by default. Thank you. I'm sorry. Okay, um, I'm not quite sure, but isn't that uh, DNS second Dane can be useful for that? Uh, yes. So, uh, in theory, so so it's not just um, you, the question was, can you not just use DNS second Dane for the same purpose? Now, uh, the issue there is that um, one deployment of those protocols is so limited. DNSSEC is getting some deployment. Dane has basically not been deployed, and so you can't get clients that, that speak it. Um, and then the, the second problem is it doesn't really protect you against uh, state adversaries. It sort of changes the state adversaries a little bit. It's basically whoever's above you in the DNS hierarchy can attack you. Other people can't, so that's all, it's, it's better. Uh, but it doesn't totally protect against it. So, so yes, I think um, people have talked about Dane as a solution to this problem for a long time, and it hasn't happened yet. Why did you choose Python to implement CertBot and not C or JavaScript or whatever is out there? Uh, so when we were making that call, I think we thought Python um, 
This is a great. In fact, I think one of our uh, project members, Noah Schwartz, has given a whole talk at PyCon about what we liked and what we regretted about this choice. Um, but so, giving the sort of thirty-second summary of that. Um, Python is pretty flexible and has a lot of support for wrangling your operating system, right? It's a high-level language that protects you against large categories of, of, of memory safety bugs and so forth that lets you change stuff in your OS. The stuff that we've really found difficult about Python, um, its dependency management is not great. So working with pip has been a source of continuous pain. That's issue one. Issue two is its open SSL bindings are really not good. So Python, you know, we've used Python cryptography and Python cryptography, the issue is not that it doesn't work, it's just that it, it's fragile. Um, and uh, in particular, when there's a new version of OpenSSL, it tends to break the CFFI bindings into Python, open SS into Python cryptography. So um, that started maybe to get better because Python cryptography has started to ship its own bundled versions of OpenSSL. Um, and that means they have to take every OpenSSL CVE and scramble when they get one. And it means we'll have to take OpenSSL CVEs and scramble via Python cryptography, but it's probably worth it because now uh, you have less probability that when you type import cryptography in Python, your uh, interpreter explodes with a, like a CFFI binding issue. So I think those are the big pain points where like dependency management, um, which meant that especially early on, people would get this worth, worse install experience from us and, and uh, open SSL support, which of course caused people to have to compile the bindings. It was a lot of pain of that sort. Um, in terms of other languages that we could have picked, I think the weird, um, the t looking at, so there's now an Acme client written in every language basically. So you can actually compare to the other um, Acme clients that have um, wound up being our competitors basically to Certbot. There are two I think that are really interesting. Um, one's written in Go and Go has the advantage of better um, dependency management. Uh, it's cleaner in that respect and great built-in crypto. Uh, the big problem is it basically doesn't run on 32-bit systems. So we couldn't give everyone a certbot, uh, you know, a, a copy of certbot via Go, we didn't think. Um, the other one is, of all languages, Bash. Um, so Acme.sh is a pretty good Acme client that's written in Bash. And of course, that's the, the worst language imaginable to do software engineering in, but the thing that they got by choosing Bash was you have very few dependencies. It just runs on almost every Unix system, and they depend on, I think, like Netcat for their network communication, and uh, curl for you know fetching URLs and speaking to the web, and uh, OpenSSL, they shell to OpenSSL. And, people use it and it works and it doesn't, it, especially early on, it was like you didn't need as much stuff on your box. You didn't need a bunch of Python libraries. So um, I think those were the two other languages we could have picked and um, the reasons for not picking them were probably reasonable but came with other prices. And we would never have thought of picking Bash. Uh, like uh, it was very unintuitive that that was actually a great choice. But. Sorry if uh, this question was uh, asked before I came. Uh, does anyone vendor of Internet of Things have reached you uh, to do a collaboration about renewal certification on Internet of Things? Sorry, certification? Uh, yeah, certification, renewals, etc. on Internet of Things. Have every, every. Oh, yes. Is the short answer. We, 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 so uh, the members of ISRG include um, companies like Cisco, who are like fund, uh, like help fund Let's Encrypt, and they are definitely interested in IoT versions of this thing. Uh, we also get questions about f certificates for phone numbers. And I think those things, like, so, so there are two separate projects, the CertBot project, that, which is housed at EFF, and then Let's Encrypt at ISRG. And I think those questions are coming into Let's Encrypt. Um, and the answer thus far is yes, we'll consider them once we feel like, once Let's Encrypt feels like it's really on top of certificate issuance at the scale that it needs to happen, uh, we'll turn around and think, okay, can we issue like 10 times more certificates to IoT devices that don't have public names, like maybe in some other namespace. Um, of course, in the meantime, if your IoT device has a domain name, you can use Let's Encrypt. So it's more, would we support a separate type of certificate for a much more expansive namespace?
Um, thanks. So uh, my question is a bit related to that. Um, I recently played a bit around with OpenWRT and building custom firmware images. So that's um, basically a custom firmware for many home routers. And um, usually the traffic to the router is unencrypted because by default that thing starts a web server, then you can log in, start configuring your network settings, Wi-Fi settings, and so on, and everything that goes to the router is unencrypted. And I would like to change that to have it encrypted by default. But that's a bit tricky because either you will access the device by the IP address, which is uh, 192.168.0.1 and you cannot issue a certificate for that or you would use something like a virtual name something like uh, router.home Well um, this is for a local network, right? Or do yes. you, is this, I mean, so if it's only for a local network so uh, presumably you could run your own PKI, right? You don't have to go through something like Let's Encrypt You could use a self-signed certificate that you know the key of and just distribute d between the devices on your own network Yes, so I could of course do that, and it's also already supported. The problem is just when you flash that the firmware image by default, the connection is unencrypted, and you can of course enable crypto with a self-signed certificate, but then you still get browser warnings, and it's getting harder and harder to click around those browser warnings. So um, the best solution I could currently come up for is that I operate a service somewhere on the internet, like register a public domain name, let's name it uh, myhomerouter.org, and every time that uh, firmware image is flashed, the router contacts the myhomerouter.org service, registers a unique ID for, its, for itself, like 12345.myhomerouter.org, uses this public domain name to get, well, host name to get uh, a Let's Encrypt certificate. Mm -hmm. And then, because it also runs a DNS server, say uh, 12345.myhomerouter.org is uh, 192. 1 168.0.1 and then it could like out of the box serve its web configuration interface in an encrypted manner and that is kind of very weird hack and I wonder whether there is a better way how it could be done with let's encrypt so that I could have like a firmware image for a router you just need to flash it and you assume that the router has internet access by DHCP or something like that when it's booted for the first time that by default the web interface would be encrypted It does sound like this is the same problem, right? You have this device without a domain name that you want a certificate for e Kind of but now I have the advantage that this device is also running the local DNS server and You can do more tricks there. So it's the default gateway in the network it's not like an IoT device that's just on the network, but it's a default gateway, so you have a little bit more power there. You can serve a redirect to the synthetic domain name. Yes, so that would happen. Then when somebody enters the IP address of that router, it would establish an HTTP connection. The router's web server would say redire redirect to https.routerid.myhomerouter.org, and then it would serve the encrypted website. When it's permanent redirect, then by default, everyone who uh, once access the router, will probably bookmark the encrypted version of that configuration URL. But it still sounds like a hack. But uh, I don't know a better solution for that. Yeah, can you? I mean, if you propose one, we're open to it. That's currently the best one I can propose. I can also try to implement it, but it looks ugly. The interesting thing about it is you have this trust on first use thing that you're trying to do, right? You have no canonical way of identifying that router, right? It's like a box that just looks like every other one that comes along from that manufacturer or from your home router project. And then somehow you want to kind of, once you've seen that very generic looking box, you want to go from that to, no, I know it's my home router. I flashed like Eric's firmware onto it. And so I know it's like the right thing. And so you kind of get that with the, unique domain name that your router picks from the service, right? It's like, okay, it picked like slithytove.homerouter.org or whatever. And then that's now a, a memorable thing. And you get this property that if it picked that um, and then someone switches out your home router for a different one that looks exactly the same, but has different key material on it, um, suddenly it won't be able to keep the name that it had previously. So you at least get the, the continuity property that you wanted from Trust on First Use. It feels a little hackish to get there via the browser. And so maybe the right way of asking this question is, do, are there features we would want Chrome or f and Firefox and company to ship that make it a little bit less painful 
to get a trust on first user experience for certain types of domain names. Um, I'm sure that they're going to push back on us and say, well, anything you design for this purpose is going to get abused by evil people with other purposes. But th that maybe is the right place to think about it. Is there a browser feature that's going to help with these use cases? Yes, like when you maybe say, okay, that everyone who uses a private IP address in the URL could get easier next grade for the untrustworthy certificate. Yeah. You could probably add the certificate directly to the browser without... I mean, sure, but I want to get around the next yeah. screen. I want to have something... Uh, but like before you do that, you could add it in settings. Mm -hmm. Just import it directly into the certificate store, and then you don't, and you miss the page, but it does the exact same thing. Sure, but what it's I no want easier, is basically yeah. somebody types in the IP address in the browser bar, hits enter, gets an encrypted cert connection without a warning. So, ironically, we probably hurt this use case historically. With the SSL Observatory project, we found all these certificates that were being issued back in like 2010 and earlier by CAs that were um, were doing this. And you know, our co-author of that paper, uh, I think, took the CAs to task for doing this. He's like, you you can't issue certificates for like 192.168.1.1 because it's failing. It's like fundamentally not performing the authentic authentication task that a certificate is supposed to perform. Um, and that's true. And the fact that there were thousands of certificates for that domain name was, was of course, evidence for that, um, given to many different people. But it may be also like, a, you know, miss the point that you want opportunistic encryption for, for a use case like this, yes. maybe. Now, uh, so I guess maybe you could try to propose a standard for opportunistic encryption to like shared domain names like mail dot, like 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 mail or localhost or 192.168.1.1 and i think maybe that's the way to move forward with that it's like propose that spec and then again we have the problem of how to get browsers to accept it and they could render it with some like cr the crossed out https and say yeah okay it's opportunistic to that host name because we know there's no other way to do it that might actually not be the most far reaching thing because like if you're using um, I th I don't remember if it's localhost or what localhost maps to, but uh, something in the browsers they don't uh, give you the warnings for the mixed content, right? If you're running whatever it is locally, so like they do already make some sorts of exceptions. It just might be expanding that exception class is maybe an achievable goal, but you know I don't speak for the browsers into how likely they are to do that. But uh, they've done things in this category before of skipping warnings for particular use cases. Um, I must admit, I haven't looked very recently, but the last time I looked, uh, the Windows story wasn't completely finished. Do you Would you like to finish it for us? Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, but maybe you can talk something about it. Uh, yeah, we our Windows story is not completely finished. Uh, the people who work like most of their time just don't have that uh, deep Windows expertise to just throw something together. Um, and we have like some possible rec uh, s outside contributors who have said they might be able to do it, uh, but it's tough if they're not like people that we are with talking to all the time. Um, it's a thing that will maybe happen. We've had several people say that, oh yeah, yeah, I could do that, but we haven't seen it happen yet. If you happen to have lots of Windows expertise and want to do a port for us, we would love to see that. <laughs> yeah, well, the... The, th the cert board running in Python certainly doesn't help. Uh, actually, well, no, no, the <laughs> it doesn't help much, I mean. It's uh, interesting, when we first launched Let's Encrypt, we talked to Microsoft a little bit, and the people we talked to at Microsoft said, actually, uh, Python is fine for, like, for an official Microsoft product, it would be a huge amount of work if we do it in native Windows land. But for, like, a little, like, for a hackerish thing that runs on Windows, Python is fine. We have Python on Windows. Um, we'll even help you with this. And then that team wound up just disappearing and not working with us um, uh, and doing other things. So... In theory, they thought it. The people at Microsoft thought Python was survivable, um, 
on Windows. Uh, I honestly don't know enough about that, like the reality of what pain you encounter. I'm sure there's some. Um, uh, I think we'd certainly be interested in people who have a, an important need for this. If you host a lot of stuff on Windows um, and you know other companies that do, and what, particularly if you want to like, I mean, you may have engineering talent to do this in-house or just want to give a grant to ISRG or EFF to do it. I think we'd be open to people who say, yeah, we'll fund a developer and for a year and then we'll, we'll implement all of that stuff. Uh-huh. Yeah, no. Okay. Uh, well, I don't have the, the funds right now. <laughs> Thanks. I mean, I will also try to fundraise for it. It's not something... It's, it's on our to-do list. It's just there's a lot on our to-do list. Yeah, no, I, I basically wanted to know where it was on your to-do list. Uh, yeah. That's basically what my question was. Um, it might not be the worst thing to do a, um, a crowdfunding campaign for. Just say, okay, we need like to fund a developer for one to two years to make this happen. Okay, here's the price. Like, Let's ask the internet to do it. If there are enough people who need it, it'll happen. Okay, I was a bit late, so maybe this was asked already. Um, what is the reason that uh, only so that I cannot that I have to have port 80 open for the standard challenge to be for the renew? I so let's say I don't have access to DNS so that I can set the DNS, and uh, with the standard challenge I have to have always I cannot do the renew on port 443. It's, I have to have 80 open. You should be able to using SNI, using TLS SNI. Uh, do you know which authentication method you're using? Yeah, I've tried using with the CertBot. I've tried using TLS, but it didn't work. It just says that it's not possible. You're probably using the WebRoot plugin uh, as an authenticator. Which web server are you using? Oh, I'm, I, I do that manually with the web servers. So I just use the standard plugin without... Any, I mean, not the plugin. I just use the standard without anything. Just raw, raw certificate authentication. Do you, you use cert bot cert only? Like, what flags are you giving to the command? So you you're saying that it's possible? Okay, then I will. Try. Yeah. No, no. My guess is he. What he, I think there's a real issue. So what he's probably doing is running cert bot cert only with dash dash web root. And then he's got a fi you've got a firewall or something that blocks it port 80? It is possible. It is possible to do it without no. having port 80 open. Okay, that, that was my question. And another question, uh, because I have many servers behind a uh, firewall, so uh, I cannot, um, because I cannot use random ports for uh, the challenge, I cannot aut authenticate, uh, renew my certificates on the different servers. So because I have the, the web ports are random ports that all point to different servers behind my main router. So Erica, there is a real issue there. So, so people who use the web root authenticator and just want to drop a file on their system, on their file system yeah. to renew need port 80, need a web server that's answer, answering on port 80. And the reason is, so, so Acme has a bunch of different challenge types that it uses to prove control of a domain name. And the ones that exist right now are... Uh, HTTP01, which means you fetch a URL and you, you get a, uh, you, the, the, let's encrypt sees a magic token on port 80. Yeah. Or TLS SNI01, where let's encrypt sees a magic certificate on port 443. Um, or DNS, where you query a special domain name and you get a special va value back on port 53. And maybe your question ultimately is, why is there not an HTTPS01 challenge that where you see a special file, yes. not a special certificate on port 443? Yes. And the, the reason we didn't put that in the protocol was because we noticed this problem with web servers that were configured with a large number of domain names, maybe say 100 domain names or something on port 80, and maybe five of those domain names on port 443. And the, what you would expect commonly is if you go to port 443 for a domain that's not one of the five that are correctly configured, it should give you an error of some sort. But what the web servers would actually, what Apache and Nginx actually do is they serve alphabetically the first domain as the default over TLS. And so what that does is it creates a situation where um, for the 95 people who don't have HTTPS yet, the 
five domains that already do, one of them has the magic ability to get certificates for all the other domain names. So on some shared Unix systems, this would actually create a, a, a privilege escalation between one of the host domains to other host domains. So I go, I, I log on to some Unix server and I, ha I make AAA.com and I make it a TLS and I get a certificate for it and now I can get a certificate for these other hundred random people who are hosted on the same machine as me. Um, so b for that reason, we didn't allow HTTPS01 um, into the protocol. We might add it in the future, uh, but it would have to check the certificate. So this would actually be, I, I talked before about the mechanism, once you've got a certificate from us, you could keep using cryptography to um, to prove control of the domain for renewal. So HTTPS01 wouldn't give you a certificate on day one when you first use Let's Encrypt, but it would let you renew. Um, yeah, that would be, yeah. And That's so we're probably gonna actually. implement this. In the meantime, um, here are your options. If you, if you don't wanna serve on port 80, serve a redirect to 443 and then the existing challenge type will work for you. So if you just uh, like put a rule in your web server, okay, listen 80, redirect always 80 to 443, it'll work. Um, the challenge will accept the redirect. Um, the other options are use TLS SNI01, the challenge type that supports um, 443, but for that you have to deploy a special certificate. And, and so... Maybe I can use so I can use nginx on the router with SNI and proxying the requests. Exactly, and yeah. so we, if you've got nginx running, er, we recently shipped the, we, we've shipped it for a while, but Erica has actually made it very reliable, so we now offer it um, to everyone by default. Basically, um, you can use certbot dash dash nginx, and it'll walk over to your nginx configuration and configure TLS SNI one. So it'll put in the certificate into the configuration file, and then. Uh, take it out again once it's, you know, so edits the config file, puts in the certificate on a, a test challenge domain, gets the certificate and then removes it. Um, so if you're okay having that temporary change to your Nginx file, we can do that for you on 443. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, thank you all for coming. Thank you for asking questions. I hope you were interested by the answers.